Hey, people are scared of the book of Revelation, right? It's, 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 it's the spooky book in the church, but it's not so spooky. We're going to go to Revelation, actually, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12. Is anybody blessed today? Yes. Somebody didn't say amen. Is, any, is everybody blessed today? Yes. You know, praise and worship, uh, you guys continue to praise for your praise and worship leaders because, you know, praise and worship, everything in the kingdom of God follows the sound. You hear the sound of a plane, then you see it. Um, back in biblical days, uh, the, art, the, the, the praise and worship team would go forth first before the army came. Um, the walls of Jericho, we know God had them shout and the walls came down. The Bible actually says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So praise and worship time is not just something we do as a religious activity in the church before the teaching or the preaching. God says that he lives in our praise. He loves to be praised. So when we praise him, the reason why we do it at the beginning of service is because when we begin to praise him, God says, I'll come and I'll dwell in the midst of your praise. And how many know if God's in the room, Everything you need is in the room. So the healers in the room during praise and worship, uh, the redeemers in the room during praise and worship, the miracle workers in the room during praise and worship. So during praise and worship, um, take that time to really open your mouth. Because, you know, here's another thing. There's no such thing as a silent praise. Uh, the Bible says this, uh, his praise shall continually be in our mouth. There's something about when you say the name of Jesus. That's why I love that song. There's something about when you open your mouth and you praise God. Um, it really does things in the spirit realm. So somebody say, I am a praise. Alright, All right, so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 12. And is it okay if you guys flip or swipe a lot today <laughs> uh, in your Bible? Um, because I like to give, a lot of stuff what I do is I like to give foundational. Um, so I will give you some scriptures um, today. Revelation chapter 12, did I give you the verse yet? No. All right. So we're going to go to verse uh, 11. We're going to go to verse 11. Um, it's a famous passage of scripture for some of us. And it says this. It says, and they have defeated him. And the King James says, and they overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Say, the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. And they love their lives not to the death. Here's the thing. One of the reasons why the book of Revelation is a little difficult to understand is because there's a lot of symbolisms, there's a lot of uh, metaphors and uh, different things like that in the book of Revelation. And so um, a lot of people tend to stray away from it. But how many know God will give us understanding? Amen. Amen. And one of the reasons why... Um, it's sometimes a difficult book to understand is because sometimes when you're reading the book of Revelation, you're reading the past. Sometimes when you're reading it, you're reading the present. And sometimes when you're reading it, you're reading the future. So when you're reading through the 22 books of Revelation, you have to have the Spirit of God to discern, okay, is this past, is this present, or is this future? And so in this verse, the reason I want to hone in on this verse is because I want to talk to you guys today about something called the X factor. X factor. Now, when I was in school, uh, hated math. You know, that wasn't my thing. I loved to read, loved to write, but I hated math. And one of the, the subjects I despised was algebra. And in algebra, they had something called what? The unknown variable. Uh, it was this. It was if you multiply this times this, subtract this, divide this by this, you should get this. Right? And you had to figure out the unknown variable. But what I found out was from the time I was born, uh, I like to call him my BC days, amen. From the time I was born to my AD days, uh, after I got saved, um, but, but even before I got saved and I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I found out that God's hand was on my life the whole time, even when I did not desire him. And so what I began to realize is that there was a thread going through my life that God was at work in my life, past tense. He's at work in my life, present tense. And he is working in my life in future tense. So when we're reading the scripture here, it's interesting because it says this. If you read verse, um, let's look at verse 10. In verse 10, we're, we're still right there. It's interesting. Uh, it says this. 
For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to the earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, does anyone have the King James Version of that, of that scripture? You have the King James Version of that scripture, sir? Do you have a strong voice? Can you read that for us real loud? Verse, yeah, that verse. Read it for us real loud. Yeah, I heard a loud voice. Say in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ to the accuser of our brethren. Stop right there. I want to say He said, for the accuser of our brethren. How many know who the accuser is? Satan. Keep going. But it is cast down. Before our God, day and night. All right, and verse eleven. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. We all know what the blood did for us. You know, I always tell people this, um, um, in this context, I always tell people this, I say, you know, uh, you know, people who are, you know, racist in the world always say this, you know, if you were dying, and they said you needed a couple pints of blood in order to live, you're not going to sit and ask the doctor, can you go find the report and the track record to see what race the person was or the blood you're about to give no, you're just going to say, give me the blood, give me the blood, give me the blood. Right? Likewise, when the devil tries to accuse you and bring up your past before you, you need to tell him, I got the blood, I got the blood, I got the blood, I got the blood. Whose blood? Jesus. Because if we're honest, in our minds, the battle of our minds, I love Pastor Tommy because he always talks about the battle of the mind. A lot of times, the enemy or the devil will always bring up your past. And he always brings up your past when you're about to step into your future. And so the scripture tells us this. It says this. We overcome the accuser. Where is he accusing us? He's always standing before God. Because here's the thing. The devil's not in hell right now. Contrary to popular belief. The scripture just tells us he was cast down to the earth. The Bible also says he's the prince of the power of the air. So he's in the spirit realm. So in the spirit realm, he's always going before God, trying to accuse us before God. You know what they did last year. They don't deserve that blessing. You know what they did uh, last week. They don't deserve that. And the scripture is telling us we overcome his accusations by the blood of Jesus. But then it says this, by the what? Word of their testimony. The question becomes, what is the word of our testimony? Because if I overcome the enemy and the accuser, by the word of my testimony, what is that? Because for a long time, the church has misconstrued that verse, and God began to talk to me about that verse. And I want to share something with you. Go to Revelation chapter 1, and I'm talking fast. We only got three hours and 20 minutes to go. Just kidding. All right, Revelation chapter 1 um, and verse number 4. Uh, and I'm reading from, which version am I reading? Seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, say who is? Yes. Present tense. Say present tense. Yes. Who always was, past tense. And who is still to come. Look at verse 8. We're going to go quickly. Look at verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, present tense, who always was, past tense, and who is still to come, future tense. What does that tell me? Anytime you're dealing with Jesus, the past, present, and future collide at once. Because here's the thing. Do you all remember when Jesus caught the woman in adultery? Or the story in the Bible where the man who was on his bed and he was crippled 
and he couldn't get to Jesus. So the Bible says they broke the roof out of the house and they let him down through the roof so he could get to Jesus. And the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, your sins have been forgiven. Uh, he also said to the woman caught into adultery, he told her daughter, your sins have been forgiven you. But here's the question, how could he forgive their sins if he had not yet gone to the cross? Because the whole purpose of him going to the cross was to pay the punishment of our sins. So Jesus did have to go to the cross because he had to finish the penalty for our sins once and for all. But here's the thing. He told the woman she was forgiven before he ever went to the cross. Because God does not deal in, dwell in time. He dwells in eternity. Which means this, any time God is in our midst or we're dealing with Jesus, the past, the present, and the future is present at once. There are some people arguing with Jesus and they said this, they were arguing over the resurrection. And they said, Jesus, when will the resurrection be? And Jesus looked at him and he said, I am the resurrection. He didn't say, I will be resurrected. He said, I am the resurrection. In other words, anytime you're with me, the future becomes now. For, so for some of us, we got to stop waiting until our behavior changes. We got to stop waiting until everything is perfect in our lives. Because you have something, and I'm going to tell you what it is, called the X factor. It's an unknown variable. It won't be unknown to you after today. But there's something in you that will allow you to produce no matter what's going on in your life. The Bible says it like this. Our righteousness. So righteousness is not the ability to never make a mistake. God is not in the business of only blessing perfect people. Righteousness is the ability to get back up. Somebody say, I get back up. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. Righteousness is the ability to get back up. What separates us from the world is we get back up. Why? Because we have something called the X factor. Now go back to Revelation chapter 12. Because I want to tell you what this sounds like. Are you still with me? Is everybody with me? Yes. Am I talking too fast? Right. This is good. I'm excited. It says this, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I don't want to bore you with definitions, but I like to give people understanding when, I, when I'm preaching, when I'm teaching. Because if I give you understanding, you can repeat it. You can repeat what I give you at will. They overcome. When I looked up this word, overcome, and I looked up the original definition of it, overcome means this, when a reign in a court of law to win the case. So it says this, and they, meaning believers, say I am one of them, Look at your neighbor and say, in case you didn't know, <laughs> I am a believer. Ask him, are you a believer? I'm just kidding. He says this, to overcome means this, when a reign in a court of law. You got that? What does the word word mean in that verse? We're still in Revelation, chapter 12 there. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I'm going to give it to you. When they are arraigned, when believers are arraigned in the courts of heaven by the accuser of the brethren, they win their case before God by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and by giving voice to what God has done in their life. See, because what is testimony? For some of you that watch the, the court shows. Testimony is evidence. If they call witnesses to a stand to give testimony, witnesses give testimony for evidence. Is that right? So he says this, when a believer is arraigned in the courts of heaven 
to determine whether they are guilty or not guilty, this is how they overcome the accuser, the devil. They overcome the enemy when they are arraigned by the blood of the Lamb and by giving voice to, with their mouth, the evidence of what God has done in their life. What does that sound like? Every time the devil comes and tries to accuse me, for the past three days, I, I kind of started feeling my throat starting to act up. And I said, no, God, you healed my son of an incurable blood disease that the doctor said he would never get rid of and he could never play sports. So what did I do? I told the devil, I'm not accepting your cold this week. I'm going to Long Beach City Church and I'm going to preach and I'm going to remind you of what God did for my son, how he healed him of an incurable blood disease. So I gave voice to, with my mouth, the evidence of what God had already done in my life past tense and I declared what he was going to do in my life present tense and I'm thinking I'm always going to be healed future tense. Jesus, it says that he left him for a season. How many know seasons always come around? There, there's a summer this year, there'll be a summer next year. There's a winter coming, there's going to be another winter. Seasons always come. So the Bible says that the devil left Jesus for a season. The question is, what do we do when he comes back? The Bible says this, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The Bible says that he walks around like a roaring lion. It says like a roaring lion. Now, I know I learned in school, I'm not a perfect English grammar, but I learned anytime you use the word like or as, it's a simile. Which means he's not a lion, but he tries to roar, roar like a lion. And the Bible says, pay him no attention, resist him, and he'll go. Sometimes as believers, when he shows up, we start acting all crazy, and think we got to do a bunch of stuff, I need to read some more scriptures, I need to pray some more. No, the Bible says... He's just born like a lion. Like a lion. He's not a lion. Resist him. Pay him no mind. Because you can't pay him mind and do what's divine at the same time. That was written to some Hebrew slaves and captives. They have been taken captive in Babylon. Uh, their enemies had invaded their land and had taken them captive, and God, through a prophet, somebody say, through a prophet, God, through a prophet, um, sent them a letter with some instruction to encourage them. Uh, we're going to read verse, I'm going to read verse 1 very quickly here, and he says this, uh, Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who have been exiled or carried away captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. Somebody say everybody, everybody. was taken captive. Yeah. Now, before I give you all of the X factor, try to get close to what it is. I want you to I want to read a famous passage of scripture in verse 11 of that same chapter. Famous passage of scripture. It says this, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster or evil, to give you a future and a hope or an expected end. Hold up. At the beginning of that chapter, we just read that these people were taken captive. They were slaves. How in the world does God have plans for them and they were just taken away captive? Because I'm going to read the scripture to you where God told them, look, I am actually sending you into captivity. Don't resist King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon. Go with them into captivity. Oh, and by the way, even though I want you to go with them into slavery, I still have a good plan for your life. Huh? One of the biggest understanding and revelations that changed my life was that there is something in me that will allow me to produce even while it seems like I'm going through hell. The 
Bible actually says that Jesus actually went to hell. He went to hell, but he was the first man to ever make it out. Because on the third day he was resurrected. So if Jesus had the ability to produce in hell, and greater work shall I do, should I not also have the ability to produce while I'm going through hell? So watch this. Because how many know slavery, that's kind of like going through hell. So in Jeremiah 29, verses 1, God tells Jeremiah to go and tell, tell them this. This is good. Somebody say, this is going to be good. Because as this church is transitioning as well into the new building uh, and to the new things God has for you, it's going to be very important because God told me to tell you guys this, and I'm getting ahead of myself. He said he's going to accelerate the supernatural for you. He's going to begin to accelerate the supernatural. At the beginning, I said something. I didn't just, just say it just to say it. I said, I like being next to churches that are hot. Because there's one thing that I know about your pastors is that they love people. I've seen them. I've watched them. I've heard their testimony. They love people. You have very few churches, even though that they preach love, that actually love people. That are actually willing to reach out to those who don't know Jesus and love them to Jesus. And so that's why I didn't mind, other than the fact that I wanted to hang out with my lady coming all the way out here because here's the thing God told me this and he told me to declare this at all of our prayer services that uh, me and my wife are having and he said this he said tell the people that any time two at least two believers are together he said an anointing is created where the power of God is created I'm going to say that again. Anytime at least two believers come together to pray, he said the power of God is released or created. The anointing is created. That's why I had us all stretch our hands towards man. Because if at least two of us can agree for his life, it'll be done. Somebody say it'll be done. Yeah. Now watch this in Jeremiah 29 verse 4. Did I say verse 4? Alright. So this is what God told me. The captives are the slaves to do while they're slaves in Israel. This is what he says. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives. He is exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. So here's the first thing he tells them to do. He says, look, while you're going through hell, while stuff is breaking out in your life, while you've lost your job, while somebody left you, while somebody's talking about you, while your body's feeling sick, one of the first things I want you to do, when it seems like the devil is taking you captive, this is what I want you to do. One of the first things I want you to do is build houses. Not have a pity party. Not call pastor at 3 in the morning, but focus on building your house. You say, well, how do I build my house? Our bodies are the temple of the living God. You build your house by praising God. You build your house by getting involved in the things of God. Uh, when you come to the house of God, I said at the beginning, you don't wait until circumstances change in your life to do what's divine. We've got to learn how to do what God has called us to do even while it seems like we're going through hell. But that's not the good part. The next thing he tells them to do, keep going, look at verse 5. Plant, build homes, plant, plant a state, plant gardens, eat the food they produce. Then he says this in verse 6. Marry, have children, find, find spouses for them so that she may have grandchildren. In other words, multiply. What does that mean spiritually and prophetically for us? God says this, even while you're going through hell, you have the ability still to multiply. You still have the ability to sow or to give. That would go over too well. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. He's telling them that even while it may seem like you're lacking in your life, 
or that you're in some type of bondage in your life, even if it's in the area of finances, because these people were slaves. They didn't own anything, but God still told them to plant or to give and to sow. And the test of the believer is, can I do the word of God when everything outwardly seems like it's falling to pieces? That's the test of the believer. Let's see what he said in the next verse. And pray for the peace or the city where you've been sent captive. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare, to determine its welfare, huh? He said, pray for your enemies right here. So sometimes there may be people in your life that are actually the ones causing the hell in your life. And Jesus is saying, look, I know what they're doing to you, but I need you to pray for them. Because your ability to pray for them determines the strength of your x your x Did you guys get that? Go to 1 John, and this is my last scripture. Towards the back of your Bible there. And I want everybody to catch this. He said, the kingdom of God is like a treasure that a man hid in a field. He says, and when he found the treasure, he went and sold all he had and bought that field so that he could dig for the treasure. He said, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. Somebody say in a field. How many know people don't like dealing with dirt? Because they get the treasure in the ground, I got to go through the dirt. And likewise, not only in regards to ourselves, but with, but with one another, sometimes we write people off because of their dirt. And Jesus says, I'll get the most out of your life if I can look past your dirt, there's a treasure inside. So when we're dealing with the X factor, that unknown variable, what is that unknown variable? That unknown variable is the presence of God. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Ghost. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 right here, we'll read, he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Where is he at? He's in you. Somebody say, he's in me. <laughs> if he's in me, what's going on around me doesn't determine whether or not my X factor works. Because he's in me. The treasure's in Somebody say, the treasure's in me. <laughs> so I can't look at Matt at his dirt. I can't look at him according to the time he had a bad day. I can't look at her according to the time she got frustrated because everybody wasn't learning their parts of the song. I can't look at so-and-so because of they didn't say hi to me this morning. Sometimes we got to get past the dirt in people's lives and understand that there's a treasure inside of them. And Jesus is saying, because he said this, he's given us the keys to the kingdom. A key is designed to unlock something. So this is what Jesus is saying. If there is something inside of her that I need, sometimes the only way I can get it is if I buy the entire field. What does that mean? I've got to take her with her dirt and all, or there's no deal. If I can't take her dirt, I don't get the treasure. If there's something that God has placed inside of your pastor that is to bless your life, the key to unlocking it is getting past this dirt. That's why as God is transitioning you guys, don't congregate and hang out with the ones that are complaining. Don't hang out with the ones that say, I'm not going there no more. Don't hang out with the ones that say, oh, do you know what Pastor Tommy said on such and such day? I'm not saying that's going on, but I know the accuser. I know his ways. I know his tactics. 
Because the revelation to you all is, if I can just get past his dirt, there's a treasure in him. If I can just get past my pastor's dirt, there's a treasure in him. If I can just get past her dirt, there's a treasure in her. And the treasure in him, and the treasure in him, and the treasure in her, and the treasure in her is designed to bless everyone. There are no more rangers in the kingdom. One of the first things Jesus did on the earth was he went and called 12 disciples. He called many, but he only chose 12. Because not even Jesus could get his work done without someone else. He could have just came to the earth, preached a little bit, died on the cross, and left. But he didn't do that. Because he knew he needed to connect with someone. Because there was something that his disciples had as well that he needed. you guys catch that? Let us stand to our feet.